Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats. And as always, we are coming to you from the podcasting studios at Czech Television, one of our chamber champions. I begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen-speaking nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is brought to you with the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, and C-SPAN Victoria Shipyards. So, a couple of things that happened throughout the pandemic in a big way. Working from home and online shopping, big part of everybody's life. We want to focus in on that today with a couple of people who are involved with property management, as in what's going to happen with what properties look like based on the changes that have been created by the pandemic. Christy Lowe's is here. She is the GM, the general manager at Uptown. Hi, Christy. Hello. And Robert Jahl is the managing director at Jahl Properties. Robert, how are you? I'm doing well, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Robert, because you've been one of the leading voices all the way through this, uh, representing business and your sector and, of course, your own company. But I want to go back to March of 2020, as painful as that can be, but it was very obvious very soon what was going on. So can we just talk a little bit about what was happening within the spaces of the properties that your company manages and owns? Sure. Certainly it was, for, for all parties involved, uncharted waters, and the immediate reaction in the mid part of March, 2020 was simply to get people back into their homes or get people into their homes. And so we saw a very accelerated uh, migration to online work styles supported by the technologies that have now become commonplace, Zoom and Teams and so forth. But at the time we're still new for many people. Um, And surprisingly that transition for most of our clients uh, occurred quite seamlessly. There was a bit of a, a teething period but the physical act of getting out of offices into home, home working environments and getting operations stood up uh, was something that happened, I think, in a more seamless manner than many would have anticipated. So both of you are uh, involved with properties that are a combination of uh, commercial, uh, retail, a uh, whole spectrum of things, uh, residential, of course, in, in the case of Joel Properties too. Christy, let's go back to March 2020 at, uh, at Uptown. Once this all became apparent, what was happening? Tell me about what was happening. What was the mood? What was done? Yeah, so we were very fortunate that we had a lot of essential services. So the Walmarts of the world, all the pet stores, um, our Michaels, they all remained opened and were able to service the public that was looking for, you know, those essential services. Um, Like Robert mentioned, our office did exactly the same thing. They had to learn how to work from home and to be able to develop that new model that was um, very new to everybody. So, Robert, when people leave the offices, and of course, there's offices at Uptown, too, but Rob, when they leave those offices not knowing what's going on, they leave behind stuff in the fridge. They leave plants that need to be watered. Tell me what happened with all that stuff. Well, gratefully, we have a a really capable team that in the context of empty buildings, we were able to keep property management functions sustaining. So buildings were still getting serviced and maintained. They were still getting cleaned at a very, very baseline level. Uh, It's not as simple as a light switch that you you turn off, the building goes dormant for six months and then comes back on. And so we were able to keep up with those things to ensure that whenever that return to work were to occur, and of course, in March 2020, nobody had any visibility into how long the the workplace interruptions would run, uh, that we would be ready. Whenever, whenever that concluded. But no question, it led to uh, some interesting things that we wouldn't normally anticipate. For example, the simple act of going around buildings and flushing all the toilets to ensure mm-hmm. that water circulation was occurring in a normal cadence are things that historically we have, of course, not had to grapple with. Yeah. Uh, and Christy, the same thing at Uptown at the shopping center. You've got the big ones, like you mentioned, the Walmarts and the PetSmarts and things like that. Uh, but you've got the smaller ones. You've got the Green Kiss and you've got Outlook's menswear. What sort of things were happening in those operations in that time of uncertainty? Yeah. So for the first couple of weeks, they definitely did shut down, as did the rest of the world. Um, but as I mentioned, we were very lucky. We decided early on to shut down our boulevard and to be able to allow the community to come and gather when it did reopen towards the end of March there. And as a result, our retailers took lead on that and then also subsequently reopened. So the little guys were benefiting from the bigger guys at that point. 
So as people started to eventually return, we're going to get to that a little bit later on too. Uh, Robert, you and I are in a fairly regular meeting where you've been stellar in keeping everybody up to date on this whole thing. So you are able to monitor how many people or what percentage of people are coming and going just by security cards and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We we are. That's something we started to track fairly early on just to get a sense of how many of the normal daily population were actually coming in. And the way we monitor that is we can detect without specific identification, the number of unique card strikes, uh, access card strikes that occur at any given building uh, on a given day. What we saw was an immediate dip following March 2020 into the mid-teens, as high as 20% and some where there was more essential services occurring, uh, but generally mid-teens was the average. Uh, and then saw that slowly creeping up to the mid-20s where it, uh, it tended to flatline for the better part of 2021. Uh, the latest reading that we've seen now, we're in September of 2022, uh, we're up pretty close to 50%, uh, but normal would be considered 85%. It's never at 100 because of vacation days, sick days, and things like that. Uh, so we've come a long ways in terms of uh, return to more normal office occupancy levels, uh, but certainly still a far cry from, uh, from full recovery to pre-pandemic levels. And you've, within your portfolio, you have some pretty cool buildings uh, that people would know. 1515 Douglas is the one right across from City Hall in Victoria, the atrium building, that amazing project you did in behind the legislature. So, Christy, at Uptown, you have shopping, but you also have spaces up top that are office spaces. People like Babcock are there, uh, our friends at Island Savings. Uh, so what what did that look like at the time for you, and, and how is the return to office space happening now? Yeah, so very similar um, to what Robert said, we saw a very immediate decline um, in some of those bigger guys, like you said, um, and also with the government offices, which I think are still slow to come back. But anybody that's in the private institution has really charged ahead. And now we're perhaps at a close to, I would say, 85% occupancy for our office tenants being back, given that we still have two BC assessment and consumer protection. Um, municipal finance, sorry, three, there's a few guys that are slow to the game, but most everybody is keen to be back into this environment. Yeah, we're not here to pass judgment on anything, but Robert, you of course have a, a number of government tenants in some of your buildings too, and there is a reluctance by those employees to return to work. What's that look like to you? Yeah, I, look, private sector or public sector, I think each individual organization or, or employer type has had to grapple with uh, with new territory here devising hybrid work strategies uh, or work from home policies that three years ago, nobody in the HR world was thinking about uh, appropriate frameworks for. And so as can be expected, people are still in the trial and error stage. Many of our private sector employers have adopted now go forward hybrid work models that take varying, varying forms. I think one we're hearing quite a lot is hybrid, which allows for two days of, of flexible or remote work, or work from home, and then three days mandated in the office. But of course, there's a lot of texture around the margin of how that looks for different companies. Uh, the government did reinstitute a, uh, a return to work program in April of 2022. Uh, I don't know the extent to which there's symmetry, ministry to ministry in, in how that looks, nor in how that's being enforced. Uh, but certainly our experience has been similar to Christie's where there has been a lag within primarily provincial government employment and its pace of return to work in an in-office environment versus what we've seen for, for private sector. Although I will say that the trend line for each is similar. It's all, it's all moving in an upward direction. I want to talk next about what the uh, office space of the future will look like and also that whole shopping from home thing too. We'll do that next. We're talking today on Chamber Chats with Christy Lowe's, who is the general manager of Uptown, and Robert Joll is the managing director at Joll Properties. And Robert, you had referenced possible looking at retrofitting of office spaces, but Christy, I'll go to, to you for this first. As tenancy does change and companies may come to realize they don't need as much space as they currently have, what will that lead to when it comes to retrofitting or remodeling office space? Mm hmm yeah, we had a pretty good example of that with one of our larger office tenants when um, the workforce did come back to work and they uh, subletted to medical offices, which is, I'm sure, a entirely other conversation that we could have on chat yes. <laughs> about the need in the community region 
uh, you know, Canada about medical offices. Um, and so we were very lucky that we have a tenant um, here at Uptown that wanted to take over that space and expand. Um, but I would say there are definitely offices that are looking to downsize uh, going forward. Robert, you're seeing the same thing? I don't think that there's a, a simple answer to that question. Yes, we are seeing certain groups that are, are determining that they don't need quite the same footprints as they did in the past. Uh, but I would say in the majority of cases, amongst our clientele, both public and private sector, we're seeing people make decisions that reflect an ongoing commitment to their previous office commitments uh, or office footprints, and in some cases, actually even growing further. Uh, what we're seeing, though, change in is the way in which people are specifying and provisioning those offices with an anticipation that they'll be used in a different way than in years past. So the prioritization is shifting to collaboration areas, meeting rooms, gathering spaces. And I think what that's suggesting is that there's an anticipation that when people are doing focused work, uh, dependent only upon their own selves and a computer, they can do that oftentimes from home in a more productive manner than perhaps in office. But those collaborative functions, the culture and team building functions that benefit, I think, more from that in-person uh, time is seeing then a reflection in the physical premises in adaptation to be built out in such a manner that nurtures those activities. I think the other thing that we're seeing play out across our portfolio is that there is no question, there is incremental interest right now in better buildings. And better buildings is a, is a loose term, intentionally vague. But what I mean by that in this sense is in great locations with great amenities, great architecture and interior design properties, the kind of space that people want to be in and feel inspired to be in. And we generally joke about it amongst our office as we have to create space and we have to create buildings that overwhelmingly compete with the kitchen table, right? And it's not in terms of long-term potential for the industry, we're gonna be viable, not because employers force people to come back to the office, if that's the mentality on which we're hanging the future viability of our business, we're just riding a sinking ship. If instead you're focused on orienting to properties and property operations that create spaces that people want to be in self-selectively and it make things like the commute and the other things that get talked about as reasons why work from home has been popular worth the trouble, that is when we're going to know that, that we've succeeded in positioning our portfolio well in terms of what I think is going to be driving office demand in the future. Yeah, and both Jaw and Shape, the company that operates Uptown, you both operate really cool spaces. I mean, they are aesthetically pleasing to look at and they're fun to be around. And just before we started recording today, uh, Robert mentioned, Christy, about what you've done with the main drag, the main street at Uptown. That's been kind of a cool pivot. Tell me about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we decided very early on that we wanted to close off Uptown Boulevard and allow it to be just pedestrian friendly. Originally, our thought was to welcome the community because they couldn't be inside their homes. They couldn't visit with, you know, grandma and grandpa, their best friends, anybody. So they would come to, you know, share even in occasions of like a birthday party would be happening on Uptown Boulevard and some of the same um, furniture that we had prior to the pandemic. Um, and then what we quickly learned is everybody loved it uh, and we needed to activate it. And the one great thing I will say about Shape and um, the company that we support and love is that they believed very strongly in supporting marketing dollars. So while other um, property management companies decided, you know, not to go out and promote people to come and, and put up signs like, be careful here and don't do this here, we welcomed everybody to come um, and really embraced it. So quickly early on, we painted Uptown Boulevard. Um, in the summertime, we had different performers that would come. We had music. Um, and then this year, we decided to further enhance that, given the popularity of what we saw that was happening. And we put forth the lawn. So we uh, created these different activations that would be like kids climbing areas, or different chairs. Um, and what we really saw was that people were embraced it, uh, welcomed it, and uh, truthfully, we've been busier than ever before. So it's been a big win for us. Right, and that's there to stay, I'm quite sure. Okay, uh, the online shopping thing, I wanna swing over to that right now. So Robert, you have, you have commercial tenants, you have retail tenants in some of your buildings. How did that all kind of evolve for them with that whole ordering online thing and pickup and delivery? What have you heard from them? Well, look, 
amongst our clientele, which is majority office, our street front retail and restaurant tenants were without question the most acutely impacted uh, in the immediate period of the pandemic and, and forced a lot of creativity and, and entrepreneurial instincts to be flexed uh, to figure out how to stay viable. Um, there was a few things that emerged from that. I mean, well documented is the people that that stood up online platforms in record time. The people that say in the food service industry started piloting delivery or, or takeaway models where they theretofore hadn't hadn't done so. And I think what's exciting about that is that all of that builds business model resilience on a go forward basis. That gives other other streams of income, other manners of reaching their customers than perhaps previously existed. And in many cases, while the normal operations, as it were, in terms of in-person shopping, in terms of in-person dining, that those have returned and are, and are generally robust across most of our customer base, uh, that some of those other uh, new avenues uh, of business generation remain intact. And, and so hopefully that's, that's positive for uh, how they can compete in the marketplace going forward. Yeah, and Christy at Uptown, you've got Browns and you've got uh, Good Earth Coffee and you've got Starbucks, you've got that ice cream thing going on too. But how, how did that all shift? What did, you, what did you hear from those tenants as all that started to happen? Um, well, I would say, so the first thing for us would be Walmart's um, adaptation to this uh, pickup service. Um, and all of that was very new to our operation. So we basically had to recreate and figure out an entire area where that would um, transpire. And as a result of that, it's been forever popular and they're looking at doing something, you know, further long term to that. Other areas that didn't do so well for us would be like a Starbucks, for instance. So they would have a pickup area that would be in one of our stalls on Uptown Boulevard and it didn't see any traction. So I think we're a different model in the fact of what I said about closing down the boulevard. People wanted to come to Uptown for this experience and be able to sit and chat and interact with their friends. And I think that was one of the greatest successes that we had versus some of this online pickup stuff. It was a combination of both, I would say. And just a quick note about this, because we are the chamber. When you're ordering things online, whatever it is you're buying, you can find it locally and still get it delivered locally. So I'm not saying this to slam Amazon or somebody, but whatever you buy, books and clothing are really big online like that. You can find that stuff here. And you know what else with the clothes? You can try them on here and you don't have to send them back. Just saying. Uh, okay, up next, I want to talk about the fact and what this will do to office and other spaces. COVID was an airborne virus. We'll talk about that next. Office space, commercial space, we're talking about today and what's the future of all that with Christy Lowe's, the general manager of Uptown, and Robert Jall, the, the managing director at, uh, at Jall Properties. Robert, I think it might have been you that first presented this in a meeting that we were both in, that the movement of air in retail and commercial spaces and office spaces might have to change in the future because of how this virus was transmitted. Is that Am I clear on that? Yeah, I think that that's something that it certainly received heightened scrutiny because of COVID, but it has bearing on many airborne viruses that we grapple with on an ongoing basis, even as simple as the common cold. And what's exciting is that the last two years has seen a step shift in terms of the engineering know-how, in terms of enhancements to indoor air quality. Uh, most of our buildings now, and certainly all our new buildings are provisioned with uh, systems that allow for once through air, they're very conscious of how induction effect works such that we're not promoting too much in the way of cross ventilation. So you have an air stack that you breathe, the air is out and it's exhausted out of the building and then fresh air is coming in. So there's not a lot of cross contamination that occurs. Um, obviously there's been a lot of advancement in filtration technologies that can look at, at air as it's getting tempered and filtered through the buildings or circulated through the buildings that it can pass through various levels of, of density of HEPA filters. I think there's also uh, some ways in which we move through the building. So you're talking about airborne but I think there's also an increased consciousness of non-contact mobility through buildings. So we've gone through and retrofitted most of our primary points of, of ingress and egress with motion sensor activated door operations. Um, and frankly, regardless of what comes next in terms of course of the pandemic specific to COVID, all of these things are things that have just become now ingrained best practice in, in how we are specifying new buildings. And I think that, again, for whatever the source of, uh, of touch-related or airborne disease, 
uh, all of these things suggest healthier working environments uh, for people going forward. I think there's also cultural pivots that have occurred and uh, I'm sure many of us have experienced this firsthand. The sensitivity, you know, pre 2020 of somebody down the hall from you coughing or blowing their nose in the winter time, um, that was, hey, good for you, toughing it out and doing one for the cause. Uh, obviously, that's not a workplace culture that, uh, that exists to nearly the same extent now. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly positive thing that there's now mm -hmm. that, that view that, you know, if you're sick, stay home, get better. And doing so, you're doing a, a, a gift of good service to, to all of your coworkers, none of whom have any interest in being sick, whether that's COVID, the flu, the cold, or anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which is where the paid sick days comes into play, but we're not here to talk about that. So the same, thing, that, the same thing when we talk about a retail space, though, Christy, that may be a little bit tighter, a little more compact than an office might be. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Yeah, we have... Yeah, we have very similar um, parameters around what Robert said, um, the filtration, um, airly, uh, sorry, nightly air purging. Um, we also work very hard of bringing the outside air into the premises. Like there's a there's a system that's well beyond my comprehension that we are very lucky to have here. Um, and the same applies to the retail link. I will say just um, on one point um, to that is the sick days that have been offered to employees such as we have, like with custodial and security, that is a huge shift in the industry for us um, and very much benefits the entire workforce, as, as Robert mentioned, like those people would be coming to work on, you know, uh, definitely not feeling their best and and now they're able to stay home and and I think that's great not to be able to transmit anything really. We're just about out of time so I just want to do a quick piece here on uh, all of you do ongoing maintenance and renovations and even new builds and construction within your properties and we've heard so much about supply chain. Robert what's the impact of that aside from cost what's what's going to be the impact of of our uh, threatens to threats rather to the supply chain? Yeah so there's no question that continues to have an effect uh, Bruce, it does have implications to cost, no question, across all aspects of our of our construction cost stack. Uh, and of course, there's also now new uncertainties and delays in delivery timing. Uh, oftentimes, when you're dealing with complex construction uh, or even complex maintenance issues, you know you have a multitude of suppliers and product type and component types that are coming from all over the world. And sometimes there is choke points where if that one thing doesn't show up, everything downstream of that. Uh, can't occur. So it's made forecasting the cost of jobs and the timelines of jobs much more difficult than it was previously. You know, two and a half years now since the onset of that pandemic, uh, the implications of some of those supply chain challenges remain as acute as ever. Yeah. Amazing insight from both of you. Thank you so much for all you've offered with us today and shared with us. Christy Lowe's is the general manager of Uptown and Robert Jahl is the managing director at Jahl Properties. Thank you both so much for being here today. I'm Bruce Williams and we'll see you again for another Chamber Chat. <laughs>